Good morning. Please open your Bibles with me to 1 John chapter 4. We've been here in chapter 4 for some time now, studying love. In particular, we began with studying love as a divine perfection in God, of course. And then we've moved from that to studying love as a human affection. Because we are commanded in 1 John chapter 4 to model our love after God's. And so our love is a reflection of God's perfection. And last week, we were making distinctions in the way that we talk about love and the vocabulary that we use. So we we talked about liking something where you view it as good and you're attracted to it. We talked about lusting, which is desiring something that does not belong to you. It's, It's loving something so much that you're willing to violate boundaries for it. We talked about true love, which is doing good for someone. We talked about lying, where you say that you love someone, but you're really just manipulating them, and you won't serve them until you're served. You won't do good for them until you receive the good that you want. And so we were making distinctions in that sermon. And if we have a grasp of who we are as creatures and what love is, we we can begin to put things into practice and to get even more practical about how to love. And so this sermon is going to focus on two parts to the sermon. The first is what are those things that obstruct love? What gets in the way? What obstructs love? And the second part of the sermon is what are those things that construct, that build up love? And this is, of course, not an exhaustive treatment of all the things that obstruct love or construct love, but sort of focusing on and touching on some of the major things that obstruct and construct love. Let's begin by reading God's word in 1 John 4, verses 11 through 21, where we get our marching orders to love one another as God has loved us. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another... God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. Because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. Well, let's begin our outline with the first main point, which is a question, what obstructs love? What obstructs love? Love, And as I speak about love and what obstructs it and what constructs it, I'm not just referring to love between spouses, love in a marriage relationship. This, this applies to family members, it applies to friends, it applies to, to brothers and sisters in Christ. We are speaking of love in general to be applied in the various uh, contexts and levels of relationships that we have. So what obstructs love? And the answer to this question is so very easy. Just look in a mirror and you will have the answer to your question. You obstruct love. You get in the way. But how can we organize this a little bit better and explain it a little bit better? So we're going to talk about two ways in which you obstruct love. And then each of those two ways, we're going to show it manifested in three things. So the major heading is what obstructs love. And the first thing is going to be pride. And then we're going to talk about three ways in which pride manifests itself in our relationships and gets in the way of our love. What obstructs love? Pride does. How is pride manifested? Firstly, in self-love. 
Pride obstructs love in our relationships when it manifests itself as self-love. When you love yourself the most, guess what? It's hard to love other people. And so if you are prideful and you love yourself the most, it will be very hard to love others. Why? Because love is other-centered. True love is giving and serving to the other. And if you love yourself the most, you're going to give to yourself the most and serve yourself the most, and that will get in the way of love. Pride puts you at the center of your life. That will destroy love. The greater you become in your own opinion, the more important you become in your own estimation, the more you love yourself, what happens? The less you will care for others, the less you will care about others. You'll choose your own happiness, your own good, your own well-being, your own wealth, and your own wheel above that of others. So if you have pride and you love yourself, it will clearly and easily get in the way of loving others. But here's the problem. The problem is everyone knows this. Everybody knows this. This is nothing new. No one's sitting here thinking, wow, I, I never really thought about that. Well, maybe you are, but most people realize that if you love yourself the most, it doesn't help in trying to love others. The problem is that we're not honest with ourselves. We're not honest about our pride. We're not honest about just how much we love ourselves. Everyone acknowledges, well, sure, we all love ourselves to some degree, and yeah, I can see how that would get away. But you're not being honest about just how much you love yourself, just how prideful you really are. And then you wonder, why is it that I'm facing difficulties in my relationships? Why is it that there's conflict in my relationships? It's because you have not been honest with yourself about just how much you love yourself. Pride obstructs love. It gets in the way, and we must overcome that obstacle. And we need to realize and recognize that we love ourselves the most. Secondly, the second way in which pride manifests itself and obstructs love in our relationships is selfishness. And of course, these are all very much related and they overlap. Selfishness. Self-love is when you love yourself the most and so you care about yourself the most. Selfishness is when you won't help the other person. You won't help the needy. If love considers the needs of others and then helps them according to their needs, selfishness will get in the way because you won't help the needy. You don't want to. You don't care. Selfishness obstructs love. The needs of the other will be invisible to you. Their needs will be unimportant to you. Their needs will be less of a priority to you. It's not just that you love yourself the most, that's the first point, but you also don't even see the needs of the other and you don't really care about the needs of the other. Why? Because of the first point, because you love yourself the most. Self-love manifests itself in selfishness where you won't help others. You choose your needs over others. You seek out the best for yourself. When you were a child, or perhaps you still do this, if a cake is sliced up for everyone, do you take the best piece? Do you take the one with all the frosting? How do you make your choice? You know, if you pick the best piece, guess what? No one else gets it. And you might think to yourself, well, someone has to get it, so why shouldn't I? They're going to be selfish about it, so I might as well take it. Someone's got to eat it. But think about it. When you're selfish... What you take for yourself, someone else doesn't get. The cake illustration is just an illustration to say, when you take, you're taking away from others. And so if you're constantly taking for yourself because you love yourself the most, you're not giving to others. You're not caring for others. You're not considering and addressing the needs of others. And your choices, when they're so blinded and just thinking about yourself, you're not realizing the effects of your choices. You may think, so I took a piece of cake. What's the big deal? Well, the point is someone else didn't get that, therefore. And so if you're busy serving yourself, being selfish, someone else may be suffering for it. And if selfishness disables you from seeing the needs of others and helping others in need, then clearly selfishness is a great enemy to love. And if it is a great burden for you to help others, if it's like pulling teeth to do what someone else wants to do, or if it is torturous to attend to the needs of the other, then you need to do some serious repenting 
of your selfishness. If it is so hard to just do what someone else wants you to do, if it is so difficult to give yourself over and accept what someone else desires, if it is so difficult to put their needs first, you're very selfish and you need to repent of that and it will destroy any relationship you attempt to build up. It will obstruct love between friends, between families, between spouses, between brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. Love helps the needy, cares for the needy. Selfishness obstructs that and we must overcome it. Third, the third way in which pride manifests itself in our relationships and gets in the way of love is self-centeredness. Self-centeredness. The first point was you love yourself the most. The second point is you won't help others. Third, self-centeredness, I have, what I'm referring to here is you will serve others, but only on your own terms. You won't serve others unless it's on your own terms. So yeah, I'm going to serve other people, but my service is self-centered. I'm I'm serving you, but it's really not about you. It's about me. I will serve on my terms, in my way, when I want to. You see, sometimes people are willing to help. They're willing to serve. They're willing to participate, but only when it suits their purposes, only when it meets their needs, only when it contributes towards what they think the goal should be. They will help when they get to be seen helping. They will serve when their ideas are the ones being put into action. They will serve when the circumstances suit them. But that's not service to others for others. That's self-service. That's self-centered service. And so you could say, well, I'm serving. I'm serving the other. I'm helping the other. But it's all for yourself. If we're self-centered, If even our service and our help, so-called, is truly and ultimately about us, we're not loving. We have gotten in the way. We have obstructed love. And this is what we mentioned last week when we said that love that is not given except in exchange for something is not love. It's a lie that pretends to be love. So also, service offered on selfish conditions is not service. You're not serving the other. You're serving yourself and using the other to accomplish it. And this this happens even in churches, brothers and sisters, where people go from church to church until they can find the way that they can serve the way that they want to serve. They have an idea of how they're going to live out their own personal ministry, whatever that means, and they'll go to a place until they find where they can do what they want to do and serve in the way that they want to serve. And if their personal ministry, again, whatever that means, is not being given to them, then they view themselves as being held back and even repressed by the church. You're not letting me live out my personal ministry. Well, isn't even the word ministry about serving others? And serving others is about what they need, not what you want to do as self-fulfillment. So we can see that even in the church, our service, so-called, is often self-centered. Serving in the church, true service in the church, is about what Christ has commanded us to do. To help his sheep according to what his sheep need. And a true Christian, I'm not trying to say that that those wouldn't do this are not true Christians, but a true Christian spirit, a true Christian heart will say, I want to serve my Savior, and I want to serve my Savior's sheep. I am one of them. What can I do? Tell me what I can do. I will do it because I love the head of the body and I love the body. I love the Savior and the sheep. It's not about me expressing myself. It's not about me fulfilling myself. It's not about me satisfying myself. It's about serving Christ and his sheep. If love is serving others, and it is, then self-centeredness will obstruct our love. It will get in the way. I will help when I get to help the way that I want to help when I want to help. That's not help. That's not self, that's self-service, That's self not serving others. And those are all forms of pride where we're at the center. We're running the show. It's about us. And that's not appropriate. Indeed, it is sinful and it is not love. It gets in the way of love. The second thing that obstructs love, again, not exhaustively, the second thing is fear. Fear. In what ways do we manifest fear 
in our lives and thus obstruct love in our relationships. Again, I'll offer you three ways, and they're very much connected still to pride. They're very much overlapping with the first section. The first thing is anger. Fear manifests itself in anger. And what I mean by anger is when we hurt others. When we hurt others. Anger lashes out, and it harms the others because it lashes out at them. Now, surely there is a just anger. There is a righteous anger. Paul commands us to be angry and not to sin. So there is a righteous anger. We can be angry about sin and injustices, and we are rightly indignant and upset about those things. But when I speak of anger here, I'm assuming it's the sinful anger, because your anger is 99.9999999% sinful. It is very rarely the righteous anger of the just. So when I speak about anger, I'm assuming it is anger without justice, anger without good cause, anger that simply expresses your emotion, that simply vents at the other person, that is self-expression without consequences. I'm going to let this out, and I don't care what the consequences are. I don't care what it costs you. I'm just going to dump it on you. That's what I mean when I say anger. You just blast it out. Now, does that obstruct love? Of course it does. Love is destroyed by anger because love helps, but anger harms. Love blesses, but anger curses. Love edifies, but anger crucifies. Love hugs, anger hisses. Love answers softly, anger vents rage. And how is this connected to fear? When we're afraid of something, we attack it. When two people are in conflict... They become rivals in some way. They're pitted against each other. And when you're pitted against someone, when they they become your rival or your enemy, fear grows. What are they going to do? What are they going to say? How is this going to work out? What's going to happen to me? All those questions, the unknowns, they become fear and they manifest themselves. One of the responses is anger. We're afraid of what we don't understand. We're afraid of what we can't control. We're afraid of what will happen. So instead of loving the others, we spew anger at them, and it harms them. It doesn't help them, and that gets in the way of love. It obstructs love very obviously. Let's move on. Other forms of fear. You can see also how anger is related to pride. This is about me getting out what I want to say. It doesn't matter the consequences for you. So not only is it pride or not only is it fear, it's also pride. It all mixes together. The second manifestation of fear, still connected with pride, is unrepentance. When we won't repent of our sins. Another destroyer of love or obstructor of love is unrepentance. And this is oftentimes just a form of self-protection, often motivated by fear. You're afraid of the consequences, so you protect yourself by not acknowledging your sin, not confessing your sin, not repenting of your sins. You don't want to place yourself in a position of vulnerability relative to the other, to the other person. If you say, I was wrong, if you say, I sinned, if you say, I did the bad thing, if you say, I am not in the right here, now you've placed yourself in a position of submission to the other person, so to speak, relatively speaking. Some people don't want to do that. They will not put themselves in a position beneath the other person in the relationship. So they won't repent. They're afraid of what will happen. They won't acknowledge their wrongs. They don't want to give the upper hand to the other person and become vulnerable. You don't want to be the one who messed up. You're not going to repent because they haven't repented of what they've done. And if I repent but they don't, then what's going to happen? You're protecting yourself, you're afraid. And you don't care that you've wronged the other person and that you've hurt them and that you've sinned against them. It's more important that you protect yourself out of fear than that you help the person that you've just harmed. You don't care that you've inflicted a wound on them. You just care about protecting yourself, which just adds wounds upon wounds. A lack of repentance, a lack of admitting, acknowledging, and repenting of our sins will be a giant roadblock and an obstacle to love because it, it makes reconciliation impossible. 
not repenting of your sin, will entirely 100% subvert any efforts to promote love in a relationship. 100%. Unrepentance will get in the way. It will one, completely block the road. It destroys trust. It creates conflict. And it sets up a you versus me struggle for power. There's no love in that. Thirdly, unforgiveness. Fear manifests itself in unforgiveness when we won't forgive those who truly repent. It's not just when we won't repent, it's also when we won't forgive those who do repent. Those who love themselves and fear others, pride and fear, want to control others. They want to keep others in a position beneath them or a position, a position in which they can control them. And one way to do that is to refuse to forgive people. If you keep the other person in a perpetual state of asking for your forgiveness, asking for your mercy, asking for your renewed affection, you have all the control you could ever want. They're now the slave and you're the master. That's not love. That's control motivated by fear and pride. Forgiveness is the snowplow of relationships. It clears the way. It clears the path. It smooths the path. It removes the obstacles. Unforgiveness, therefore, when someone, assuming that someone is truly repenting, unforgiveness, therefore, intentionally and on purpose, says, no, I'd rather there be a huge obstacle here. I would prefer that we cannot move forward. I would prefer that re reconciliation cannot be effected. You are placing an unremovable obstacle in your relationship that only you can remove. If you, if you repent to me of, for sinning against me, and I won't forgive you, no one else can forgive you. No one else can, can bring in the second half of, of the reconciliation in that equation. And so if you refuse to forgive, you are saying, no, we will not be reconciled. No, we will not allow love to rule in this, to, to not just rule, but to flourish in this relationship. No, I don't want it. I don't want love. I don't love you is what you're saying when you won't forgive. And that's likely because you're more interested in a hostage negotiation than you are dealing with your problems. You're interested in just hand over the goods and no one gets hurt. That's not love. That's not forgiveness. That's manipulation. That's fear. That's pride. That's anger. That's cruelty. That's self-love. That's self-promotion. And it's entirely inconsistent with a soul that has been saved from hell by free grace through the death of Jesus Christ. To refuse to forgive those who truly repent is the absolute opposite of love. 100%. Now, brothers and sisters, it's a bit depressing <laughs> to consider all the ways in which we tear down our relationships. But that's only half the sermon. If, if this sermon is, man, we are terrible at love and that's really bad. All right, let's go home. Everyone will just be like, oh, no. What do we do? But that's what the second half is about. Because John is teaching us to build love, to show love, to manifest love. We can overcome these things. We can work through them. We can work past them. We can build up the love that we have torn down. But it takes hard work. Children, how long does it take you to build a Lego set? Step one through a hundred, a thousand pieces. Boy, that takes a while, doesn't it? How long does it take you to tear down that Lego set? Oh no, I tripped and fell on it. It's all gone. Well, love is easy to tear down. It's easy to vent rage. It's easy to not forgive. It's easy to not repent. It's easy to love yourself. That's the easy part. But constructing love takes quite a bit. Now, this brings us to our second main point. What constructs love? And I want to suggest two things to you, mirroring the first half of this sermon. The two things are going to be humility and confidence, and we'll see how humility can be manifested in three ways, as well as confidence being manifested in three ways. And these are the opposites of pride and fear, humility and confidence. <clears throat> Again, there will be overlap in the second part of the sermon, just as there was overlap in the first part. 
Let's begin with humility, which is humbling yourself. It's not just a passive characteristic of, well, I am a humble person or I'm not a humble person and it's passive. No, we are commanded in the scriptures to humble ourselves, to cultivate humility. The humble do not esteem themselves greater than others or greater than they are. They are keenly aware, the humble are keenly aware of their insufficiencies, their shortcomings, their flaws, their weaknesses, and their dependencies on others. So the humble don't forget themselves and just think about the others. They're keenly aware of themselves, but they're aware of their problems. They're aware of their shortcomings, their sins even. And above all, they're aware that they're creatures who need the sustaining hand of their creator. And when you have a true and appropriate view of yourself, it will automatically humble you. You realize who you are. You realize what you are as a creature, which being a creature is not a bad thing. It just says you're not the creator. You're not the king of the universe. You're not all that there is. How can we manifest humility, self-humbling? This is something we do to ourselves. How can we manifest, in that, in our, how can we manifest that in our relationships in a way that constructs and builds up love? Three things. First, Repentance. Repentance. Repentance forfeits your glory and your pride. It gives it up. There is no glory, there is no pride in repentance. Repentance acknowledges that you have done what is wrong and asks for forgiveness. True repentance admits the sin in full, is sorry for the sin in full, and works in the opposite direction to pursue the holiness that is opposed to the sin of which you are repenting. If you want to construct love, you need to humble yourself by repenting of your sins, not just to God, but more specifically, when you sin against others, you need to repent of your sin to them and ask them to forgive you. And you need to show in your actions, not just your words, that you are repentant. You need to admit the sin. You need to be sorry for the sin in your heart, and you need to go in the opposite direction, pursuing the holiness that is opposite to that wickedness of which you are repenting. If you love someone and you have sinned against them, the fact that they have suffered for your sin should have a profound influence on you. And your repentance should be motivated not just by the necessity of it on your part, but also by a desire to initiate the healing of the one against whom you have sinned. So your repentance isn't just about you, it's about them. To do this, you must humble yourself and be proactive in confessing your sin to those against whom you have sinned. And brethren, that will construct love. Forgiveness is that snowplow. It clears the way. It humbles you. You cannot be proud while confessing your sins. It's impossible. And any any confession with pride just isn't a confession. It's not right. Second, the second way in which we can manifest humility in our relationships and thus construct love is forgiveness. Forgiveness. You have to humble yourself to grant forgiveness freely. When someone repents, forgive them. You cannot forgive them apart from their repentance. They must repent. Nor should you instantly forgive if their repentance is genuinely suspect. I'm not saying that you hold everyone's repentance hostage, but sometimes it is quite clear that this is not genuine. Or the context, the context urges caution at times. We must be wise here. But in any situation, we should be so cultivating a heart that desires healing, so cultivating a heart that desires restoration, that when you see a genuine repentance, you are ready to forgive. You are there. You're, you were already there. You were waiting for them to repent. You were hoping that they would repent. You want them to repent because you want to forgive them. So whatever I say about being cautious about forgiveness based on the fact that there are insincere repentances, 
Don't let that ever in any way negate the fact that everyone should be cultivating a heart that is absolutely eager and ready and willing to forgive the other when they repent of their sins. Why should we be like this? You have been forgiven much. That should cause you to love much. Jesus said of the woman who anointed him with oil, who is called a sinner in the text, and the Pharisees say, why are you letting this sinner anoint you? And Jesus said, therefore I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much, but he who is forgiven little, loves little. Jesus was saying, you Pharisees, your love is so weak and ridiculous because you don't see your sin This woman loves me deeply and sincerely because she knows her sin and she's been forgiven of it. Brothers and sisters, we're not Pharisees, are we? Have you not been forgiven much? Then love much. And that love will demonstrate itself. It will manifest itself in forgiveness. Third, the third way in which humility manifests itself in our lives and relationships and thus constructs love is mercy. If you want to build up love, be merciful. Do not make relationships a power struggle. Mercy helps those who can't help back. Mercy gives freely without receiving in return. Mercy helps those who are not in a position to repay. Mercy enters into the suffering and experience of others. Human mercy does. Show others that you care about them. Show others that you're not trying to control them. What do you do when the other messes up in some way? Do you take advantage of that and use it against them? Do you seize control? Mercy declines opportunities of self-advantage and power. Mercy says, even in a case where I could selfishly take control here and use this in the power struggle against the person and over the person, I will not do that. The door is open for me to serve myself here. I'm not going to do it. I won't. Mercy declines to turn the failures of others into triumphs for yourself. Here's some examples. Are you better at arguing than your spouse or your friends? Are you a better communicator, better at reasoning, better at argumentation? Do you use that to overpower them in discussion or debate? Do you use your strength to overcome the other? or to help the other. You see, mercy does not use strength and advantage to gain the upper hand on others. There's no love in that. There's no mercy in that. Have you ever been in a conversation where you know what the other person is trying to say or argue, but they're having a hard time expressing it? Have you ever helped them to articulate their own argument even though you don't agree with it? Do that. Have you ever helped them to say what they're trying to say even though it's not what you want to hear? Or have you used their lack of clarity as an opening to gain a point and strike a blow? That's pride. Be humble. Be merciful. Don't compete with others. Compliment others. Be a compliment, not in terms of, oh, you're so wonderful compliments, but helping them, being a helper. Be willing to be the loser. Be willing to cede to others on purpose, not in matters of truth, of course, or right and wrong, but in the things we talk about in relationships. Be willing to be the loser. Be willing to cede to others on purpose. Paul says to have lawsuits at all with one another is already a defeat for you. Why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? The peace and the edification of the brethren is more important than me having my say. It's more important than me getting my way. It's more important than telling them they're wrong about something. You need to take, you need to go to Costco for mercy where you can get the huge quantities and then take all that mercy and just dump it into your relationship. And then you need to go back to Costco and get some more and repeat. You need massive quantities of mercy in your relationship because you're so prideful and you're so power hungry, and you're so ready to take advantage of any situation that presents itself where you can get the upper hand in your relationship. But if you're busy being merciful, you will decline those opportunities, and you will help the other to avoid those opportunities. You're not going to jump on them the moment they slip up or when their weaknesses show. You're going to protect them and help them even when there's nothing in return for you. That's mercy. 
and that requires humility. That is humility. Moving on to the, the second thing that constructs love, and that is confidence. John says perfect love casts out fear. Love builds confidence and trust. How can we cultivate confidence and thus construct love? Well, the first way in which we manifest this or build it up is through service. Service. Get busy serving the other person. And as long as they're not power hungry and selfish, see what happens. It turns out, This is maybe a surprise. It turns out that sincerely serving other people tends to make them like you more. It turns out that taking care of other people and seeking their good tends to make them view you positively. In other words, if you serve others and they see that, it builds trust and confidence they start to think of you as, that person is seeking my good. That person is concerned for my well-being. Is that constructing love brick by bit, brick and piece by piece? Of course it is. Now, of course, this requires humility as well. So humble yourself and serve others for their sake. And you will cast out fear. Rather, you will build confidence and thus construct a more perfect love. Secondly, How can we construct and cultivate confidence in order to construct love? How can we manifest confidence? Well, with patience. Patience. I've told you to serve the other, but don't serve to be seen. Serve to improve the good of the other. Serve for the sake of the other. And be patient. Press on. Not everything you do will be seen. Not everything you do will be acknowledged. Not everything you do will rebound back at you. But you're not in it for personal gain. You're not in it for personal benefit. You're in it to love the other person. So be patient. And see what fruits patient, peaceful, humble service will yield. Stick with it. Clear the weeds. Till the earth. Sow the seeds. Water the roots. And see the fruit of love grow. Be patient. It won't happen instantly. True love that lasts is that love that is built brick by brick by brick so that the finished product is worthy of confidence and trust. Serve and be patient and confidence will increase in your relationship and in your love. Now we could easily come back to mercy at this point because mercy breeds confidence. I trust you because I know that You're not going to take advantage of my faults and my flaws and my failures. Mercy breeds confidence. You don't get near a dog that's threatening and snarling. You will invite a dog that looks looks affectionate, and they show you those big eyes, those puppy eyes, and you say, oh, puppy dog, come here. But the dog's snarling at you. You don't go near it. And so in your relationship, if if you show mercy and kindness, and service, and patience, what does that do? It draws the other person to you in reality. They're drawn to you because you're really helping them. You're really caring for them. It's, it's not a lie. It's absolutely true. It's truly building real things, which builds confidence. If the other knows you're merciful and won't snap and yell and bite and bark, they'll be drawn to you with confidence and fear. You're afraid of the snarling dog. You're confident in the the puppy love, right? Mercy diffuses bombs. Mercy turns down the heat. Mercy desensitizes our hypersensitivities. So be patient. Take the time. Thirdly, wisdom. Wisdom. Wisdom makes decisions that help to accomplish goals. The wise decision is the course of action that best accomplishes the purpose. So if I want to get to the exit door straight ahead of me in the back of the church, the wise decision will be every step that takes me closer to that door. My goal is to get to the door. Wise decisions will take me closer to it. God has commanded us to love one another. And so our goal is to love one another. We need to use wisdom to make decisions that contribute 
and promote and push us towards accomplishing that goal. Now, that means you need to use wisdom to love different people. If love is other-centered, other-focused, and other-serving, you need to apply wisdom to tailor-make your love for that particular person. And the way to construct love with your spouse, with each child, with your parents, with your in-laws, with your friends, your siblings, your neighbors, your co-workers, your brothers and sisters in Christ, all of these are different. There's overlap, certainly. But the love that you ought to construct with your spouse is quite different from the love that you construct with your neighbor. And so you, you need to use wisdom to make decisions that construct love in each of your relationships at every level. You need to make decisions that enable you to best love the other. This means that love is hard work, but it's rewarding work. Because what happens when you get there? What happens when you accomplish your goal? What happens when people start caring for one another and taking care of one another? What are the results? What are the profits? What are the benefits for such an investment? Love. Who doesn't like love? Everybody wants true love. And obviously we don't get to decide whether or not we want to participate here. We've been commanded to love. But why should we, when we think about how difficult it is, why should we huff and sigh at the thought of loving one another? Unless it's because we love ourselves so much and we love others so little. So brothers and sisters, kill pride. Kill fear. Repent of your pride. Repent of your fear. They, they obstruct love. They get in the way. Cultivate humility. Cultivate confidence. Construct love as God has commanded us and as a reflection of God's love. And because we have been loved by God in and through Jesus Christ, if we love greatly, it's because we have been forgiven of much. If we love lightly, if we love little, it's because we think we've been forgiven little. Brothers and sisters, Jesus Christ shed his precious blood on the cross to save us from our sins. Ought we not to love one another as a reflection of that? Indeed, that is what we have been called to and commanded to do. If God has so loved us, let us love one another. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, once again, we are reminded of the imperfections of our love, indeed the sinfulness of our love, and we ask you to forgive us. And as a part of our repentance, we desire to pursue the opposite holiness. We desire to pursue true love, a pure love, a righteous love, a holy love. And so we ask that by the power of your spirit, you would bless our efforts, that you would help us to cultivate and construct and build up true love amongst ourselves in each of our relationships. Oh, Lord, please give us wisdom to know the best ways to do this, not only obeying your law clearly, but also applying principles of wisdom to enable us to obey your law and to live within the boundaries of your law. Oh, Lord, please bless our efforts to put to death the pride and fear that is within us and to build up humility and confidence. How we thank you for your perfect love poured out upon us in Jesus Christ. And we ask that you would enable us to reflect it in our lives with gratitude and with thankfulness for the great debt of sin that has been, that has been paid on our behalf in the blood of Jesus. We thank you and we praise you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.